Didn't want to do that. <laughs> Good morning. Thanks for watching. This, I'm Jason Roski, one of the KC Auction Appraisal here today, and we're doing our KC Auctions video blog. And I'm excited to have our guest today, Tracy Cayley. Tracy owns Cayley Appraisals in Kansas City area here. She's been in the jewelry business, appraisal business for about 30 years, give or take, and is one of our most trusted uh, most trusted colleagues. She looks at every piece of jewelry that we sell. And we're excited to work with her and excited to have her on. Tracy, I know you have a lot of letters behind your name. I know you have a lot of uh, history in the industry. What can you tell us about how you got involved in it? What's excited you about being involved in it and jewelry business? And, and how do you decide to open up your own appraisal company? Sure, sure. So thank you, Jason, for inviting me today. I, uh, as, a, as a child, I had a real passion for... Uh, rocks and minerals. So my eyes were always peeled to the ground. Uh, I started a rock collection and my mom noticed. Hi mom, I know you're watching. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she bought me a piece of poster board, took me to the library, and uh, we checked out books on rock and mineral uh, in identification. So I took on that hobby as a kid. And uh, that eventually led me to heading out to California to study at the Gemological Institute of America. So I earned my graduate gemologist diploma back in 1988. Uh, I came back to Kansas City and served an internship with Tom and Harold Tibble at Tibble. And that was instrumental in starting my career. Uh, Harold Tibble instilled in me uh, the importance of honesty and integrity and continuing education uh, that was so very important part of just the foundation of my career. Uh, I then, after the internship, worked for a small family jeweler in Lawrence, Kansas. And then I followed that up with uh, a decades-long uh, service at Jewelry by Design in Curry Village. Uh, Jewelry by Design is a jewelry design and manufacturing studio. Uh, Philip Vetch, the owner, taught me everything there is to know about jewelry design and the manufacturing process. So that was key in uh, really uh, establishing my appraisal part of my career. So I assisted him with gem and jewelry, diamond, uh, acquisitions for his jewelry designs and also provided the appraisal service at Jewelry by Design. Uh, back in 2006, I rejoined Tibble and came full circle, which was a joy because Harold Tibble still, even after he retired, uh, visited the store every day and he would come to my office and we would talk jewelry and gemstones in the industry. It was just an amazing uh, period of experience for me there. Uh, back in 2015, I decided to establish my independent service. So I have a private office now where uh, I work with clients by appointments. Excellent, excellent. And so just going through that, it, it, it dawned on me, I realized, um, and we've talked about this a little bit before you and I, but you really been involved in every aspect of the jewelry industry from creating, designing, to sourcing the materials, to working retail and tables a little bit, uh, and then doing appraisal work. So you you have come to it from, your appraisals come to it from a much deeper knowledge base than a lot of other appraisals. How important do you think the experience that you have, how does that distinguish you from other appraisal companies? Or is it that big of an issue? Or and what do you see as being a positive there? Oh, I'm so grateful for the experience that, that I did receive, uh, especially through Jewelry by Design, where that design and manufacturing process is a big part of the value of uh, jewelry. So uh, being able to source gemstones and diamonds, I also did the same at Tibble, assisted in colored stone acquisition and diamond buying. 
uh, uh, really essential to what an appraiser does. Uh, I have seen such a variety of colored gemstones and pearls and diamonds uh, through all of the years that I've served for all of these retailers that have really made a difference in my career. Excellent. And then actually, you know, we have a bunch of questions we talked about before and things like that. But that, I want to phrase a question we talked about a little bit differently because of that. One of the questions that we get as an auction company, because we sell a lot of jewelry, we sell about, over a thousand pieces a year. Um, one of the questions we get, or one of the, the scenarios we see regularly, is an appraised value for a piece might be ten thousand dollars, but it's realistic secondary market values two, three, four thousand dollars, maybe five thousand dollars. I know the conversation, what you just talked about, the craftsmanship and the, the work goes into it. But what, why are why are jewelry value appraisals usually so much higher than what it might actually sell? Well, there are different values that can be assigned on an appraisal, and it does depend on the situation uh, that the client is in. So if the client is in a resale position, we would be looking at not retail value, but resell value. Right. And the research involved in that is, uh, is looking at comparables that have recently sold. And that would be considered fair market value. What is a willing uh, buyer uh, pay a willing seller, neither one being in uh, a compulsion or fire sale? Uh, and that would be considered fair market value. So when you look at an appraisal, it's very important to look for what the purpose of the appraisal is for. So insurance replacement is going to be higher than resale value. Right. Absolutely. And, and that's one of those things that we talk about regularly. It's, and people want to be have a, a long, longer explanation for it, but it really is just as simple as there are costs to having a retail store. And if you're an artist, which jewelry makers are, you should get paid for your work and your time. And just like any other piece of art or jewelry or furniture or cars, the secondary value doesn't take that into consideration as much. So true. So the craftsmanship, the design work, all of the manufacturing processes, all those labor hours that bring a brand new piece to the market is something that you pay for at retail, um, but you're not going to get that back. You pay people for their work, and yeah, you don't recoup that part, but you do recoup on the, the, fine, uh, the fine parts or materials of the piece. Right, absolutely. There's always the intrinsic value of the materials. Um, but once, unless the craftsman, artist, jeweler is known, uh, there's usually not a lot of secondary push for that. Um, You're so right. yeah, great points. So talking about craftsmanship and interesting pieces of jewelry, what's you know more of a fun thing? What's the most interesting piece you've ever appraised or worked on? Uh, and, and tell us about that. And, and uh, sure. Let's that a little bit. Yeah. So uh, a, a very beautiful art nouveau, uh, fleet de jour, diamond, and conch pearl brooch. Uh, and I think you have a photo of it. That was a really fancy way to say painted brooch with pearls and diamonds. <laughs> <laughs> well, Plique... Yeah, it's, it's a stunning piece. Yes, yeah, so this is a fleet de jour, which is an enamel that is similar to stained glass. You see through it. And this particular piece has very articulated leaves, a uh, very complicated piece. Uh, this piece was designed and created by Marcus and Company. Uh, Herman Marcus actually worked for uh, Tiffany and Company before he established his own uh, business with his sons. Uh, this particular piece uh, was a group of brooches that they created for the 1900 Paris uh, exhibition. Uh, this particular piece came across my desk. A uh, goldsmith friend of mine referred a friend of his who was the personal goldsmith to a very prominent family in Wichita. Uh, this, amongst a couple of other pieces, uh, was gifted to him. And eventually he was in a retirement situation where he, he decided he was going to let this piece go. He needed to sell it uh, to enhance his uh, retirement fund. Uh, so his estate attorney 
uh, recommended that he go to a, a, a jeweler, a local jeweler, and this particular jeweler offered uh, somewhere around 5000 for this piece. Uh, he knew as a jeweler this was probably not right. He, he, probably, he thought this, this has to be more valuable. Uh, this brooch did come in the original box and is in incredible condition. Many times uh, there is damage to those small uh, enamel pieces that you see in the leaves and the, the flowers of this piece, but this is in excellent condition. I reached out to a friend of mine, a colleague out on the East Coast. Uh, I assume that uh, this particular family acquired this brooch out in New York. The, uh, eventually, the auction house took it on to consignment uh, and, and assigned an estimate of thirty to 50000 Wow. The hammer fell at $160,000. My goodness. Yes. And ultimately, which this is my absolute favorite part, the winning bidders uh, donated this piece to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. So this uh, this piece of hit jewelry history can actually be seen by me, you, and the public. So, it's on it's on permanent display. It is. Oh, that's amazing. Now it's it's a beautiful, beautiful piece, and and, and you know I know you've talked you and I have talked about that a couple of times over the years, and you couldn't really say much about it at different times, but yeah, it's it's such a neat neat thing. And, and I agree completely. So let me, so that brings up, you talked about a couple of things there. I want to talk about the QHR questions. You mentioned they were offered, I think on your website, you said 2,500 here, you said $5,000 for this piece from like a we buy gold or something like that. Right. And those services can be very valuable, but tell me why is it, how, should, how do people protect themselves from having that happen? Cause that piece could have easily been lost to forever. Right, that could have just gone for been disappeared forever. So, how what kind of things should people do? Um, how do they look at their jewelry and decide should I look have something like Tracy look at it, or is it not worth that? What kind of things should they be looking for? Oh, absolutely. So I do a lot of consultation services when people have questions about what it is that they have, uh, what is in their grandmother's collection, their mother's collection. Uh, we can look through it and determine uh, what are fine. Uh, fine jewelry pieces, what are costume pieces, what might be a very important piece with some, uh, some history to it. Uh, so definitely, uh, I would recommend seeking out an independent appraiser to get that kind of information. Yeah, and so what, what does make an appraiser qualified? Are there certifications? Are there licensing? Is it regulated? What kinds of what should people look for in an appraiser if they're not in the Kansas City area, if they're watching us from California, or if they're watching us from wherever they might be? And if you're watching us from someplace else, tell us where you're watching. We'd love to know that. If you have any questions, let us know. But what should people look for in a qualified appraiser? Sure. So um, unlike real estate appraisers uh, who are licensed and regulated, personal property appraisers are not at this time. Uh, we as an industry are working towards that. We really hope that we can achieve that sometime soon. Uh, in the meantime, what that means is uh, people really need to look uh, for an appraiser that has some credentialing through an industry organization. So uh, I am a member of the International Society of Appraisers and went through a formal training and education in appraisal theory and methodology and report writing. Uh, all of that is critical to protect the client uh, and, you know, to assure that they're working with someone that uh, has been vetted. Yeah, because it's, you and I have both seen the horror stories or heard more horror stories about what can happen if somebody doesn't have things looked at. Oh, absolutely. Uh, definitely. There are jewelry appraisers uh, out there who are operating that don't even have a graduate gemologist diploma. So very scary. Absolutely. So when somebody's calling and looking at a website or calling somebody, just ask, what have you done? What's your experience? How do you, how can you tell a diamond from a cubic zirconia? Um, all those kinds of questions. Because it's it sounds almost too simple, but it really sometimes is the most simple questions that give you the most glaring answers. Um, you bet. 
There are yeah. free credentialing organizations. The International Society of Appraisers is one. Uh, there is also the American Society of Appraisers and the Appraisers Association of America. So looking on any of those websites uh, will lead folks to, uh, to a credentialed appraiser. So, yeah, absolutely. So somebody's gone through those websites and they find you or your, co your colleague in St. Louis or Chicago or wherever. Um, yes. When is the time, why, when should somebody hire you? Why should they hire you? What do you see as the most common time for people in their life cycle to contact an appraiser and, and why are they doing it? You know, I have a variety of clients. I have young couples who have just newly engaged. Uh, they want an independent appraisal from, uh, you know, that in addition to maybe an appraisal that the selling jeweler, jeweler has offered them, they wanted an independent opinion. Uh, I also have many families who come in with family collections, mom's jewelry, grandma's jewelry, and uh, they simply want to know what is fine jewelry here, what's costume jewelry, how should we divide this collection uh, equitably amongst the family. Um, I also do a fair amount of IRS appraisals for, for taxable estates. Okay. And then once somebody has contacted you and they're, it's a, it makes sense, what's the process? Can they sit there with you while you're appraising? Do they have to leave with you? Can they leave with you? Can you go to their location? Can you go to the you know, safe deposit box in the banks? What, what's the process and how does that work? Yeah, so as an independent, I do have a private office. Uh, many young couples decide to sit in on the process. Uh, an engagement ring appraisal generally takes about an hour to an hour and a half. Uh, I also have clients who uh, bring their collection to my office. They don't necessarily sit in on the process. And I also offer on-site appraisal for a large collection. So I do uh, take my equipment to the client's home or office or bank vault. Whoa, are you still there? I am. Okay, yeah, are I just, you? Yeah, I, I saw your lips moving and nothing coming out, so that's weird. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, jewelry is a fashion accessory, right? I mean, it's nobody needs jewelry, but people love it. How do the trends, how does current market forces dictate or challenge or change in effect and praise value on jewelry and does it or does the value of the piece always say the same or can it fluctuate up and down uh so interestingly enough there are some insurance companies who put a, an inflationary bump on your scheduled items and uh that is uh, that is for your protection to make sure that you're not underinsured however all of the markets, diamonds, colored gemstones, uh, and each and every one of those colored gemstones, rubies, diamonds, tourmaline, uh, all move uh, in their own uh, individual markets very differently. Uh, pearls, for instance, I have a, pair, a strand of Tahitian pearls. Uh, back in the 90s and, and right around 2000, Tahitian and South Sea pearls were incredibly popular and uh, the pricing just skyrocketed. Uh, but after a time, the trend, uh, the trend just kind of um, faded away. And so essentially lower demand means lower pricing. So pearls have, have done a little bit of an up and a down. Uh, diamonds in general uh, increase in value, uh, but that they also have had some periods where they have decreased very slightly. Gold market, obviously, and platinum markets uh, dictate the value on the uh, precious metals. All right. Um, question about diamonds since you brought it up. Um, you know, I know more about jewelry than I probably thought I ever would know, and I still feel like there's many things I don't know a clue about. Um, when people describe diamonds, obviously the carat size is easy. That's how big the stone is. That's an easy metric for anybody to understand. But then you get into letters and numbers and combinations of such. And I kind of have an idea, but for those, and I was, and imagine, especially newlyweds, uh, who are buying their engagement ring, have no clue what they're looking at for the most part. What 
can you give us a quick, you know, I know that's like you took a four year course on gemology, right? I mean, you have studied this intensively for a long time, but is there like just a quick Cliff Notes version that, that people kind of have to start from uh, to get an idea of what they should be looking for and, and, and what kind of dictates a good stone versus bad? You bet. So um, most diamonds these days, the vast majority of diamonds these days are sent to the GIA laboratory for a grading report. The four C's are carat weight, color, clarity, and cut. Cut is probably the most misunderstood. Many people think of that as a shape. Is it an oval, a marquee, a round? Uh, but cut actually means cut quality. So how that diamond sparkles. Cut quality can have, uh, have an effect on diamond value by up to 30%. So that's a huge one. So looking for cut quality uh, is, is very important. Color is more of a personal, uh, you know, a personal choice. Clarity, clarity is what's happening inside the diamond. Is it eye clean? How clean is it under magnification? And then obviously carat weight, that's very simple. 100 points per carat, so it's a half carat, one carat, and so on. And all of those four C's affect value. And is there, uh, like, is there a good resource online that kind of talks about, you know, this is a, this 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 metric is a good stone, an investment quality stone, a cheap stone you buy, you don't care if you lose on a vacation. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody wants to lose a diamond on vacation. <laughs> no, but it happens, and you'd rather lose the one that's, you know, you know, uh, M, M color than a G color, right? I mean. If you're going to travel with your jewelry, you want to travel with the jewelry that you don't mind losing because part of the reason I have insurance and have appraisals is for the insurance aspect of it, and part of that is loss. So, you bet. Um, so is there, is there a, a reference stone. online that kind of talks about, you know, the, the different qualities and values? Yes, yes. So there is a ton of information out on the Internet on anything and everything, including diamonds, and you can find some accurate information and not so accurate information. So I highly recommend, I know, right? I highly recommend going to GIA or the Gemological Institute of America's website. It's gia.edu, and you can find some excellent information on the four C's and what to look for in diamonds. Just figure that out real quick. GIA.edu. Yes. So that I'm screen here real quick. Um, you know, I'm making banners as we're talking, so uh, kind of a cool toy. Um, they, also, go ahead. They, also, they also have great information on colored gemstones. They have a complete library that discusses uh, each and every gemstone. Really great information. Yeah, because it's, you know, something I've learned is that every gem, stone, every stone is different, right? Emeralds have inclusions. They just do. Uh, yes. So it's not a matter of whether they do or don't. It's a matter of almost the quality of the inclusion or the... the right. Finding a finding an eye clean emerald uh, is is going to be very difficult as compared to say a blue sapphire. Uh, blue sapphire is you know easier to find in an eye clean stone. Very cool. Very cool. Um, and let me get you back on the screen there. So one of the questions, and I, I hate to put you on the spot like this, I didn't ask you about this earlier, and you can talk in generalities. But we get called for appraisals all the time. And uh -huh. one of the first three questions, and I'm sure you get this question all the time, is how much does it cost? And is there, and, and can, is, is it based upon the value of the stone? Is it based upon the value of the jewelry? Or is there some other metric? How, what, what does it cost somebody to get an appraisal in general terms? And I'm asking for your rates, but, you know, sure. that kind sure. of thing. You feel comfortable answering that question. So personally, I charge by the hour. And depending on the complexity of the pieces uh, determines how much time. So I do offer an estimate before uh, the work is done. Uh, it is completely unethical to charge by value. So percentage of value, uh, no, that's not a great way to uh, be charging someone. Uh, that creates a, a kind of a conflict there of interest. Right. So. 
Uh, there are uh, appraisers that do buy the piece as well. Uh, so yeah, there's a variety of ways of, of how appraisers charge. And so you start, you charge by the hour. What is there? And I know every piece is different, but generally, you've done a lot of jewelry and you do a lot of jewelry. How long does it take you to appraise a piece or 10 pieces or 20 pieces from a state? Good question. So, like I say, there are some uh, pieces of jewelry that are very complicated, engagement rings being one of those. Uh, say an Art Deco bracelet that has maybe more than 100 different diamonds of different sizes can take quite a bit of time. Whereas, say a gold omega necklace uh, it is a very simple piece so you know it could take anywhere from 15 minutes to an hour and a half to appraise one piece yeah is is and what is the long you said an hour and a half is that the longest it's taken you to appraise a specific piece or have you had longer more complex i guess it just depends on how many pieces are if it's a big like you know chandelier necklace with dozens and dozens and dozens of stones that could take a long time to actually really appraise right Yes, so a diamond rivier, a uh, necklace that has, say, pear shapes and per, uh, uh, marquee shaped diamonds that has, you know, over 100 carats total weight can take, uh, it could take all day. I've also appraised some bling for the Chiefs, and those, those take uh, a considerable amount of time just because they have so many small diamonds. Uh, is that uh, are recent? Are those recent jobs you've done since January? They haven't gotten those rings no. yet, have they? No, no, I haven't seen any cheap jewelry uh, since COVID. <laughs> yeah, because they don't get their rings until the next season starts. I don't think so. Yeah, they haven't, they haven't right. released those. But yeah, that's yeah. I mean, Super Bowl rings. We look at them historically, they just, and they get bigger and gaudier and more ostentatious every year. Yes, I have had some championship rings uh, come across my desk, so those are always fun to see. Uh, also, Chiefs players, uh, you know, some of them really love those huge dinner plate size bling pendants, right? Uh, right, uh, and and they need those insured. Yeah, they do because they're they're a big target, um, both physically and. Oh, all right, so let's see, Penny. Keelan Bowie asked, how often should I have an appraisal done since value fluctuates? Which is a question I was going to follow up with. Is there, how, how often, as Penny asked, is there a standard in the industry of you should get an appraisal every year, every five years, every 25 years? Or what's, what do you suggest and what do you see? You know, in general, I recommend every three to five years. Uh, markets fluctuate, uh, as we were talking earlier, each gemstone uh, and mark, metals markets uh, move independently, uh, but in general, in three to five years, we'll cover you. Yeah, that's kind of what we hear and see as well. Um, so we have been a, we've had a great talk this morning, Tracy. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we've covered a lot of the questions we talked about before and some that we didn't. But I know being someone who's been in this for a long time, uh, somebody could, and somebody could ask me 50 questions and there'd be 50 more, I'd be like, oh, we should have talked about this. So before we sign off for the day, is there anything we didn't touch on or that you want to touch on or just mention about you or the industry or trends or things that you think are interesting? Anything at all you want to talk about for the next two, three, four, five minutes? Uh, what would you like to make sure that our, our viewers and, and watchers know about you and the jewelry industry and appraisals? Sure, sure. So uh, probably what I have seen um, more so just in the past year or two uh, is uh, synthetic diamonds, lab-grown diamonds. Lab-grown diamonds have uh, been on the scene uh, in the jewelry world for at least 10 years, but they've really uh, been able to advance the processes and also grow larger diamonds. So that is definitely a new part of the jewelry industry, indicating, uh, identifying synthetic diamonds uh, can be very difficult. I do have a full lab here, and uh, that includes a piece of equipment that assists with identification of, of synthetic diamonds. Uh, I've had folks question the, the value of synthetic or lab-grown diamonds, and what I can say is that as the processes continue to 
uh, improve and the larger diamonds that they can grow, uh, the lower the cost of those diamonds will be. Uh, and so in comparison to a natural diamond where the resources of our Mother Earth are limited, uh, you know, do you want to purchase a diamond that's going to go down in value or do you want to, uh, to purchase a diamond that's going to retain some value? Interesting. So I, we've never talked about the synthetics other than just a quick mention. Um, so if you have a few minutes, I'd like to just kind of delve into that. You say they grow them in a lab. How do, what do, you, how do you mean, what do you mean by that? And and how, how good are the quality of the diamonds, the synthetics compared to, like you said, a stone that's been mined from, from Earth? Sure. So uh, synthetic diamonds were actually invented by GE back in 1953. So it's not a new process. Uh, those diamonds have been grown for industrial purposes. So anywhere from uh, diamond and uh, uh, diamond encrusted drill bits and, and saw blades to coatings on uh, our our uh, our spaceships, our rocket ships. Hmm. So and even the Hubble uh, telescope has uh, some diamond coating in it. The uh, process of uh, creating a, a jewelry quality diamond came much, much later and uh, is now really a, a significant part, not a significant part, but, but you know, a, a, a part of the industry that is mentionable at least. Huh. And so, you know, there's, there, there's a lot of conversation around the you know, a stockpile of diamonds that say De Beers has, and mm -hmm. there's more diamonds than could ever really be consumed, and it's you know a true monopoly, monopolistic type market. Do you see the synthetics affecting value of, of the natural stones to a degree that's going to change the markets at some point, or is it always going to be like a also ran or you know kind of like electric cars are today? We kind of see that they could, but there's. Yeah. Is there, is there going to be a point that they become more prevalent than the natural stone? So we've had synthetic emeralds, synthetic rubies, and synthetic sapphires since the early, early 1900s. And they have never overcome or uh, somehow put the natural out of business or, you know, um, out of favor. Uh, I think that's going to be true of, of diamond. People like natural. They uh, like the idea of a, of a piece that really comes from our Mother Earth. Uh, yeah, I just uh, I don't see it doing that. Really, what I see more so is um, just a decrease in the value of those lab created as the processes continue to improve. Kind of like electronics. The better they become, the easier it is to mass produce them. And the, and exactly. the more accessible they are. It exactly. makes sense. And I could see people buying a synthetic to replicate a really nice stone they have that they could wear on vacation or to the theater if they were concerned about something happening. Um, oh, yeah, absolutely. And, and, and protect their real asset, but still get the recognition that they have it. <laughs> and we wanna, Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Because you want to, you know, if you, if you have a three carat diamond, it's a really good stone. You want people to know you have a three-carat diamond. There's no reason. There's no reason to have it to leave in the jewelry box, or at least I don't think so. That's what insurance is for. Absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> and as far as the, mono the monopoly is concerned, uh, De Beers did for many decades monopolize the diamond industry on the wholesale level. But there are some big players up in Canada and up in Russia that are really giving them a run for their money. Uh, these days, uh, we're seeing diamonds on wholesale from manufacturer to, or from the mining to the manufacturer. Uh, uh, these pieces come up for auction. So we're seeing a, just a more transparent uh, way of, yeah, of purchasing and, and that, that uh, line of distribution. Yeah, I read an article on the New York Times last year about that company in Canada. It's run by, run by a woman, I believe, um, who has opened up a mine in South Africa. But they're doing it as ethically as they can. Um, and they're going, yeah, right from the mine to the auction floor. 
Yes. It's really, really upsetting a lot of people in the industry because where there is transparency, pricing becomes more democratic. Um, and it, yes, and as we know, auctions are the way to let the market speak. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, Tracy, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we went into some great conversations in areas I had no idea we were going to get to. For people watching, Tracy, like I said, been in the industry for over 30 years, has all of the education and experience you ever want or need in Joy Appraiser. She does amazing work for us. I know she works for some of the biggest and most known companies and families in the Kansas City area. And if you need her work, her to help you. Uh, her, Tracy at KayleeAppraisals.com. Her phone number is 913-912-9122 or KayleeAppraisals.com. Even if you're not here in the area, she can help you out. You, you'll have an email, drop her an email, and she can help you, direct you on your way if you need more things answered in a, in a timely fashion. Or if you're someplace else, she can help you find colleagues around the country. Because I know she's very active in, uh, in, in the organizations that she's involved with. Tracy, thank you so much for watching. And... Uh, Thank everybody else for watching us and see a little comment real quick. Oh, your just your mom said thanks. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for watching, Mom. Thank you so much, Jason. It's been a pleasure. Absolutely, Tracy. Thank you. And uh, for those of you watching, let me go ahead and. Uh, oh, come on. I'm still getting used to my new toy, which is StreamYard, and I think it's working really well for this. But thank everyone else so, so much for watching today. You can always find us. I think you're watching the Casey Auction video blog. We do this every Friday. We have we try and find experts around the country and around the world to address different areas of the antique auction estate business because that's where we live in. That's what we do. That's what we love. You can always find us. You can always email us directly at info at kcauctioncompany.com or give us a phone call at 816-283-3633. Our website is kcauctioncompany.com. We have to answer any questions that you have. If you have suggestions for future guests, that you'd love to hear from, love to hear that. If you have questions you'd like us to answer, if it's just me, which I still do regularly, send them in, post them here in the comments, send us direct mail, direct message, phone calls, emails, however you want to get a hold of us, we are available on Facebook and Instagram as well. Thank you all so much for watching. Have a great weekend, and we'll see you next week.